All right. Well, word up from Omaha, Nebraska. My name is Wes, and I'm one of the co-hosts for Building Bridges Virtual Book Club. If you haven't already, uh, let us know where you're joining us from tonight via the chat. And then you can also click on the participant tab. And then on the right hand side, you should see your name. And if you would like to, you can rename yourself to include your preferred pronouns. And just a quick introduction to uh, who is Building Bridges for America. We are a national grassroots organization that is about mobilizing and empowering networks of grassroots organizers who are equipped to support campaigns and causes based in progressive values. And values are very important to us because in all actuality, values are what matters to voters. And so um, one big thing um, as we go about uh, organizing, we don't know, we can't control the results, but what we can control is our effort. And regardless of the result, our effort adds value. I really love that value statement about building bridges. Also, we are committed to the development of a broad and inclusive coalition. So we are thankful for every, each and every one of you who has chose to join us and no matter who you are and where you join us from. And then ultimately we have a list of values down at the bottom. Uh, those come from Pete Buttigieg's 2020 campaigns, Rule the Road. Even though we uh, were inspired by Pete's uh, presidential campaign, we are open to any and all progressives who believe in those progressive values. And ultimately we exist because we wanna see an engaged electorate where everyone is valued and belongs because that it will help safeguard our democracy. So welcome and thank you for being a part of our book club here. We also have some lenses that help guide uh, our decision-making the candidates we choose to support, the causes that we get involved in and passionate about, and the books that we choose. And so we've chosen Adam Gentleson's uh, Kill Switch because it falls under the lens of democratic reform. But if you have been reading along, you will definitely uh, uh, realize that the filibuster has a rich, um, ugly history of racism. And so um, that reform of the Senate also uh, will hopefully address issues of racial equity, which then creates belonging for uh, all Americans. And so we really love to use these lenses to guide decisions that we make. So again, welcome. My name's Wes uh, and I'd love to have the rest of the um, book club team introduce themselves. So let's start off with Jana and then we'll go with Jenny and then we'll end with Jamel. I'm Jana CISO and I live in Lincoln, Nebraska and got involved with book club from being um, way back, uh, getting involved in primary campaigning. And um, then we kind of all kept wanting to um, keep engaging and, and, you know, doing what we can and thought a book club was a great part. So I was there at the beginning and Wes said, Hey, you want to help out? And I said, Sure. <laughs> so anyway, um, great to have you all here tonight. Hi team, Jenny Okamoto. I'm in Carmel, Indiana. We're having a drizzly day here, uh, weather-wise. And uh, yeah, I got started working uh, to get Pete uh, nominated for the presidential nomination and just kind of went on from there and have been working with Building Bridges to, on the steering committee and also help with our leadership development series. We're building a toolbox uh, to help grassroots organizers and people interested in learning more about actual organizing and how can't the structure of campaigns. Uh, so we run our, our sessions uh, weekly on Thursdays, so you're always welcome to join us for that. But I uh, got involved in book club because I was uh, participating and then they asked me to kind of step in and help moderate uh, some of the breakout rooms. So I'm so glad to be with all of you tonight. And I'm Jamel. Um, you know, I uh, joined the book club, I think, uh, a few books ago and just really have enjoyed the discussions, really enjoyed the books. And I'm, I'm not super political or anything, but um, I like I like building bridges. I like connecting people and um, you know, hearing people's different thoughts. And I just feel that that's a really important thing to do right now. And I've just enjoyed Monday nights as a result of this book club. Thank you so much, team. Um, 
I really appreciate everything you do to make all of this possible. So thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, just wanted to go over uh, a few norms real quick, um, just to help uh, guide our evening. Uh, you'll see that your mics are muted. Um, and when it comes to contributing to the discussion, you have two, two options. You can uh, post comments in the chat, or if you would like to use the raise hand feature um, to uh, share your thoughts. And then when you're done speaking, just uh, mute your mic again. And then just be mindful that we use those features responsibly because we want to make sure we can hear from as many people as possible this evening. We are recording this event for promotional purposes. We'd like to put our discussions up on YouTube. Finally got the last three weeks all on there. So uh, hopefully you have seen those links and can check out and review those discussions. But if you would not like, to, if you want to protect your privacy, uh, feel free to turn off your camera and also uh, rename yourself. And then lastly, let's just adhere to those values of respect, belonging, and joy as we go about conversing with one another tonight. And if you're new to Zoom or need a reminder, at the bottom of your screen, you should see that reactions button. If you click on that, you should then see the raise hand feature uh, pop up. It's very similar if you're joining us via phone tonight. Uh, you're just gonna click on the uh, ellipsis more button, the three dots, click on that, and then boom, you should see raise hand. So um, I believe that is all we have for sharing at this moment. And so I'm going to stop the share. And Jana, would you go ahead and uh, put tonight's discussion uh, link in the chat? And so um, we're just going to put that in the chat because um, if you want to use that to uh, follow along, you can um, if you so choose. But uh, usually we put questions in there as well. But I wanted to get started um, with just a general question for the whole group here um, before we got into our breakout rooms. And I just wanted to gauge, uh, it's almost like a mental health check-in. How are we doing? Personally, professionally, uh, politically as grassroots organizers, but like, how are we doing? And if you want to share I just want us to start off with like sharing a positive that's occurred in your life within the last week. Oof, this is not good, y'all. Like, really? I hope there's some positives that we can share here. I see Nancy's hand. All right. Um, well, I think it's really positive that people who have been vaccinated can, for the most part, go about their business. Now, the problem is the people who haven't been vaccinated, that supposedly we're supposed to be pretty safe in those circumstances. Now, I wouldn't go in the grocery store or into any other building where there are people uh, without my mask on, but it has been very freeing and just absolutely fabulous to be able to feel free to go without my mask outside. And there are a lot of places we can go outside, which is just great. And then the other thing is that I went to the um, Missouri uh, Medicaid expansion rally in Kansas City, Missouri this past uh, week. And um, that was just fantastic. There were, it was attended by about 75 people. It was a great day. I got to find people in, so I got to talk to a lot of people. And I've realized that I really, really like talking to people. So I'm looking for uh, ways to volunteer where I can actually talk to people in some shape or form. So it's been a great week. Thanks. Awesome to hear, Nancy. Thank you so much. And thank you for choosing to uh, take the vaccine um, to protect yourself and others. All right, I think we're going to go to Nessa and then we'll end with Misty. Um, it's been a really, really heavy week for me. Um, so when I have a really heavy week, uh, I just throw myself into volunteering in GOTV, and I did that today, and I hopped on Snapchat, and I connected with over 60 people for our endorsed candidates, uh, Marty Allen Cummings and Jalen McKee Rodriguez, and it was all super positive, and I, 
there is there is nothing when when you're having a, a heavy week like young voters um, because that's what you run into on their first time voters young voters and they literally like they filled my cup like Pete used to and I, I know a lot of us supported different candidates but a bulk of us are were Pete supporters but you know that feeling that you got when he filled your cup like I have that feeling today is as heavy as the last week has been for me like today is a good day so. awesome Glad to hear it. Uh, love the engagement from you, uh, Nessa and Nancy. Keep it up. All right, we're going to go to Misty and then Tracy and then Amy. Hi, everybody. Um, I had a really tough week. Um, on Wednesday, my mom was life flighted, and the first thing I thought of was Team Pete. And, you know, I reached out to Team Pete, and just asked for like thoughts and prayers, and hundreds of people were praying. And my mom was released from the hospital after being life flighted in grave condition in just uh, three or four days. And so, for all of those Team Peters out there that were thinking of my mom, thank you so much. And like, it's been, it was real tough, but you know, our, the family we created through the peak campaign was just amazing for me this week. So glad to hear about the positive news, Misty. All right, Tracy. Hey, kind of a good weekend, both the local and the uh, kind of national political level the local election went well. Everyone behaved themselves. People wore, wore masks when they were supposed to. We had two races that were decided by six votes. One they go to a recount. The other one doesn't seem to be doing that, but it was interesting. And uh, the Build the Air group is opening up a, a, a toolkit for content online. We're putting together a, a tutorial a webinar on Saturday and, and Wednesday night. If anyone wants to hook into that, the more the merrier. We can sell the infrastructure plan for for. for, for Awesome. Thank you, Tracy. And we're going to end with Amy. We need to unmute her. I don't want to do it because I, I feel like Gianna does it, but... Hopefully it's coming across. No. Is it showing up? Hold on. I'm going to hit it right now. So you should see a button that will see say the message. Uh, it says ask to unmute. <laughs> yes, the joys of technology. Yeah, it's not really working for some reason. Yeah. Amy, if you want to go ahead and share your um, positive via the chat. Okay. And hopefully we can get that figured out. But I just wanted to start with um, that positive uh, thing because I think it's always good to, um, you know, we're, Bridges is about belonging and, you know, and relational organizing. And the one way we can do that is by just sharing what's going on in our lives and celebrating our successes, whether it's uh, um, in the grassroots organizing uh, or whatnot. So. Um, or personal life. So let's get started though with our grass new, uh, grass, uh, gosh dang, breakout room discussion. And um, Jamel is going to create some breakout rooms. We have a slightly smaller group uh, tonight. And so um, we're just going to do two rooms. Um, and so Jenny and Jamal are going to lead a discussion in one room. And then Jana and myself will lead the discussion in the other um, room. Jana and I's room, Jana and I's room will uh, be recorded. So again, if you uh, don't want to uh, have your video and whatnot on there, um, let us know, or you can let us know by turning your camera off. So um, I am going to share the screen just for instructions as Jamel uh, gets those breakout rooms created. 
But for joining a breakout room, you're going to get a message popping up um, on a phone, computer, or tablet. You should see those examples. So really all you have to do is once that uh, pops up, click join. And I think Zoom may have updated it. And so it's going to appear in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. So um, hopefully that works out well for you. I'm going to join us on a new one or on my phone, just in case anyone has any issues and I can try to help you out via the chat. So um, Jamel, are we ready? We are, and I am going to hit open all rooms. Um, okay, so we'll get started. And since we don't have a guest, we'll probably be able to get through a lot of this stuff today, which will be kind of nice, a little more discussion. Um, the first question we have for chapter seven, um, and I will actually put it in, I think I'll put the question in. Boop. Hold on. Jana, I can do that for you. You got it? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I will that way you then. can just focus on facilitating. All right. Okay, question number one. Gentleson describes how Lyndon Johnson and Harry Reid strengthened Senate leadership positions through control of committee appointments, policy setting, campaigns, and other methods. What did you think about the pros? What, what do you think about the pros and cons of that kind of strengthening? Are those Senate leader positions too powerful now, too strong now? Or do you think that that's the way it should be? What do you guys, what were your thoughts when you, you were- the, the McConnell Schumer type of people? Right. Yeah. So yeah, so they talked about how Lyndon Johnson was kind of the first one who, um, and I didn't know any of this, by the way, um, who went in and, and really uh, uh, took control, you know, more control he was a over- manipulator. Right. And, um, and Harry Reid also, you know, really made those leader, those Senate leader positions, you know, really important, you know, they, they really had a lot of control over, you know, you knowing what everybody was doing and all that kind of stuff. So, especially in light of things that are happening now, what, um, what do you guys think about They know they can control and nothing gets done without their okay, which is pretty much what's going on right now. Yep. And yep. they don't, this is, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Kathleen. Uh, this is Kath. Uh, yeah. There is so much control. They don't even meet. A senator goes into a room all by themselves and speak into a, a system. There's no discussion. It, it's too cut and dried and uh, no dialogue. Yep, yep. Well, and I feel like the... Um, the, the issue itself isn't even really being addressed. It's more about the committees and all the things going in the background. And they forget about working for the people and what we really want. So I really think it's, um, it's terrible. It needs to be fixed. Yeah, I, I think, I feel a lot like that too. Nancy, did you, did you have a comment? Go ahead. You're muted. Okay, there we go. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, I was I was like, totally upset by the whole idea. You know, first, it used to be by seniority, it sounds like. And then Johnson started uh, using it to reward people for doing what he wanted and what he, you know, what just gave him more power. So the whole thing is, you know, you know what up. And uh, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for anyone except for um, the people who are in the most power and who gain the most power from being able to give out those committee assignments. So it totally needs to be changed as far as I'm concerned. The, the, the and this is Kath, and, and as well as a rewarding people, he used it as a, a means of punishing people who weren't in his Right, elk. right. Anybody else on that? I was watching the, the clip you had on, on Twitter today about the, from the speaker last week. He, he kind yeah. of summed it up perfectly. And, and it's just a, the, the power, the minority party makes sure that nothing happens. So government's not functioning anymore as a result. 
Yeah. Ever since um, McConnell decided that Obama was going to be, be an, an unsuccessful president, if it, he had anything to say about it, he would be one term. It's been that way for the last 12 years. Yeah, I can't help. And I, I think a little bit like what Carol said too, and what all of you guys are, are mentioning. For me, I just feel like, you know, they're supposed to be working for us. And <laughs> I, I, I've i never felt more distant to any of these people. You know, it's just, it, it's extremely frustrating. Look at the, uh, the statistics we, they keep pointing to with the infrastructure plan, how even Republicans across the country are in, in favor of it. Right. But, the chances of anything get getting done without the Republicans in, con in Congress and in the Senate agreeing to it? Yeah, it's 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 crazy. They're not listening to their constituents. No. Yeah, and I feel I feel like that in my own state. I don't know, Wes, you probably do too, considering what our, but you know, we have um, we have all Republican senators here, and I feel constantly always like I'm not being listened to at all. And then when you see this kind of thing, I think. I think that the, the, the these leaders have so much control. Um, it's, yeah, it's not right. It I just feel guilty every time there's a thing on land saying call your congressman to do actual. Yes, yes has an all democratic de delegation. I don't have to call anybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do, but they ignore us. <laughs> well, do you think that any Republican constituents are? getting in touch with their congressmen, the Republicans, and saying, hey, we like the infrastructure. I mean, if, if, if so, it's just falling on deaf ears. Mm -hmm. oh, and, um, yeah. you know, I don't quite understand that. Even though if the Republicans- I've called, are, even though they agree with me, I've called and left a message, and then you don't always get an email back acknowledging the fact that you called. No. Oh, I do. I got this uh, boilerplate email back from Graves and Blunt and Holly, thank you, oh, here in Missouri, saying, oh, we're, we're so glad to hear from you. And if you really want to know what I think, uh, go to my web page. Well, I don't give a you know what, what they think. I want them to know what I think. <laughs> and they couldn't possibly care less. <laughs> it's so frustrating. You know, vote them out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It is frustrating. It's incredibly frustrating. That would drive me crazy. Yeah, same. Ugh. Um, I noticed uh, um, uh, our senator, um, Deb Fisher, she's mm -hmm. our senior senator. Right. She just announced, I don't know, within the last few days that she's yes. running again for Senate. And a big thing that she said in her reasons is because this will be her third term. Like a Nebraska U.S. senator has not ran for three terms in over like two decades. Mm -hmm. And so this will position her as one of the most senior U.S. senators Nebraska has had. And that's what she mentioned in her um, reasoning for running again is she can get to those high position uh, committees to really make a difference. Um, and so I, I found that interesting reading that and then reading gentle sense work right this week. it's probably why warren wants to run again in massachusetts too well ex at least warren does some things i mean well yeah. fisher what does she do you know i mean she's nothing you never heard i mean i bet none of you have even heard of her <laughs> i take it to i haven't no i don't even know if she's a republican or a democrat oh she's a republican for sure yeah she's, she, she's kind of she, republican she, bernie sanders <laughs> he doesn't do anything either <laughs> yeah but he makes a name for himself <laughs> doing some things how useful is that really yeah <laughs> well the one thing that um the speaker last week talked about though the idea that just because you're a congressman or a senator, you know, appears to be supporting something, you shouldn't assume that um, your letter to them um, indicating your interest in that, you know, is meaningless because um, they indicated, for instance, that Senator King from my home state of Virginia, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, was supportive of reform, like on the filibuster issue and stuff, but that he wasn't hearing anything, you know, it didn't seem, you know you know, from his constituency so that that even though they may be, if, if the vote comes up, they would vote right, getting them 
um, pressure to get that bill to a vote um, can, you know, letters even to your congressmen or senators that, you know, are supportive, you know, I think can make a difference. So I, um, sure. I hadn't really focused on that and that I thought was interesting, yeah. Yeah, that I, yeah, that is interesting. And it's, that's a good thing to remember too because it definitely gets frustrating feeling like you're not, um, you know. A couple of times not, contact even mine. I mean, they're, they're uh, even my, my conservative congressman is a conservative Democrat. He, he goes along with most of what the part the party delegation wants. He's the only one that got, got back to me. The, the senators, I didn't even get an email from them. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Hi there. I'm just trying to figure out what Joe Manchin's doing. This is, I mean, what is, here's the thing. You were talking earlier. Let me just finish that. You were talking about earlier about power, but with such a slim majority in the Senate, some people don't have to be given power they've already got it because mm -hmm. it's a slim majority. And is like, is he running on dark money? Are his constituents really against infrastructure? Is he, I don't know, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. It might be money. Right. a little off topic. I couldn't maybe, agree more. I don't understand, I don't understand. And then I even heard somewhere on the news, they were like, and I didn't know it was this easy that if we make him mad, he could just hip hop boop, boop, over to the Republican side, really? Is it that easy? Yeah, it's that easy. Yeah, so that's not. It's not he really works a lot with no labels. Yeah, like what? What is his point in trying to get Republicans to work with him? These Republicans, anyway. Um, I don't. They've already said they're not going to. So sometimes power, like you were saying, and I didn't know this about Lyndon Johnson, is given, but sometimes it just winds up that way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in this case and, and have the, the, the non-party affiliated people caucusing with the democrats angus king is an independent bernie's a socialist mm -hmm. it's like, they can cause problems on their own it just from, right. from real ideology too so you, you never you don't really That's know true. with the majority what you're going to end up with very true well and Although, now it does seem to me though that the republicans are like <laughs> they're like solid you know well, they, their 11th commandment is, is always very strong you, you never criticize another republican you right. go along with you, it's unity unity you, you never hear of disarray in the republican party except for now of course it, it's always very rare but That's, bernie sanders and uh Leahy from vermont next door to me they have done some really great work for the citizens of vermont so there's a lot of stuff that they are doing and Carolyn just put uh, a, um, in response, Nina, to your comment, uh, wvcantwait.com is a leading group um, that knows Manchin and working on him. So Good. Uh, yeah, so that, thank you, Carolyn, for sharing that in the chat. Yeah, that's great. I'm excited to hear that. Yeah, she, yeah, exactly. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on to the second question. Um, Gentleson in chapter seven pointed out that from 1980 to about 2020, the control of the Senate flipped 10 times and wow. the margin of difference between the parties has been consistently very small. Did you realize that before? And do you think that this is a good thing or a bad thing? It doesn't seem good. <laughs> Would you say it doesn't seem good? <laughs> I know it doesn't. <laughs> I would have to say it doesn't seem very good either. It hasn't worked out all that well for us, Democrats. Um, I didn't realize it had always been so small. It always seems like, for the most part, it's, you know, it's in the hands of Republicans. And it isn't always, but they certainly know how to use the filibuster and, and maneuver around. Mm -hmm. So no, I don't think it's a good thing. I think we need to get out the vote you know, in 22 yeah. and 24. Yeah. We need to get oh, more Democrats in, in office. Senate than the Democrats do? People Can you say that again, longer. Tracy? Do the Republicans have more people who have been in Senate longer than the Democrats do? You know that, Wes? I don't know. Yeah. 
if, if they if they have a part of the problem is this is Kath that you're talking about getting more Democrats out. We've got in New Hampshire anyway. It's about forty percent independents, and then you got the divvy up for the other right. the rest of it between uh, Dems and Republicans. Well, it is the independents that are holding things up. I was just asking if Republicans have been there longer, they have the seniority, they have the, the plus committee assignments. They, they've been there long enough to know the lay of the land and where the, what the rules are. And the Democrats are trying to catch up. That's the only, my question. Well, you know, speaking of independence, didn't more independence break for Biden this last time than for Trump? Or is that not true? I don't know. Is that is that I don't know the official numbers, but um, I believe they they did um, shift. I don't know if ultimately Biden won more independent votes, but um, you know what? To me, in answer to that question of the Senate constantly flipping back and forth, to me, it's just a sign that the Senate needs reformed, mm -hmm. and the Senate does the Senate literally gives power to the super minority because the super minority does not represent what more than 50% of Americans want. Right. We right on. want for the people act. We right want on. to expand voting. We want to deal with climate change. We want gun reform. We, and none of All this of is happening for the last God ever since I was born right. because the Senate's created to <laughs> can keep them in power. But, but, uh, this is Kath. Uh, this election, yes, Biden got in, but across the country, so many places have their state levels in Republican hands. That's what happened here. We lost, the Democrats lost, and the uh, Republicans took over at our state levels. House, Senate, governorship stayed in the Republicans. So that is a, a division between nationally going Democrat and locally going Republican. Well, you know, do you really think that if the Republicans insist on sticking with Trump and the big lie and the fact that, you know, the stop the steal and all of this, you know, excuse me, BS, are Republicans across the country really going to go for that? Is Liz Cheney going to be successful? You know, like, I mean, I cannot believe that they would get a lot of votes because that is, I mean, excuse me, it's just, it's ludicrous. <laughs> so, I just can't believe that. I mean, and we need to get out, we need to get out the information that, you know, the majority of the company does support all of the things that we've just mentioned, all of them. And yet they never pass because the super minority really rules the country. And, yep. you know, we need to get this information out so that people understand what's going on. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Mary, you go ahead. One of the things we have to remember that is at the state level, many of the states, Wisconsin included, where I live, are have been heavily gerrymandered. So you're going to have Republicans controlling legislatures and things like that. But you have to also look at who controls the statewide offices because in Wisconsin, I think we had something like 56% of the vote voted for Democrats in 2018 and we swept all of the statewide offices. Yet, if you look at our individual districts and things, they're re dominated by Republicans because of the gerrymandering. So it's, you know, they're, it's like they have m many prongs to their attack, these Republicans, and they play all sorts of games. And, and I know that Democrats have done that too with gerrymandering. So right now for me, a big issue is, is getting rid of gerrymandering because this is the year that we have the opportunity to redo all those districts and that'll hold for the next 10 years until the next census. I can only take the problem with the gerrymandering, this is Kath again. Uh, I read recently that some work can get done on it, but there are kinks in the system that keep it under the control of the Republicans. I don't know why, but um, anyway, that's what's going on. So we can't, <laughs> we've got to change the gerrymandering or we cannot get in people we need in. 
Well, is the only way to deal with gerrymandering is the only hope HR1? That's what I was, I, I was wondering that too, Nancy. Is, is gerrymandering addressed in the For the People Act? Well, I think it is. I'm sure it is. I think it's just it's I think I think the for the people yes. act outlaws gerrymandering. Uh, I was on last week I was on a, a call with our one of our Congress women staffers and um, the problem with the HR one was that that can get changed over again by uh, new committees in DC the next time around versus the constitutional amendment, if we can get that done. Let's hear from- Say that again. Anna. Well, the, the HR1 is, is going to be voted in in Washington. So in two years, four years, whatever, that can get voted out. It, even if it gets voted in, it can get voted out versus if the constitutional amendment can get done for um, getting rid of um, the power to be by the uh, voice of money in, in the country when a uh, constitutional amendment gets done. So I don't know if that's going to happen. We only have 56 representatives on board with it at this point. So it would be an amendment that wouldn't be able to be voted out by Congress or in the Senate somewhere along the way. But I, but I yeah, think we don't want hope, that. Yeah, but I mean, amendments are very hard to do. But the I think the hope of the HR is that by making voting, um, you know, more broad based and you know with less barriers, that you would get a representation of the people, and therefore, you know, you know, we we probably would have a you know it, you know the the chances of it getting you know, changed are probably less because the the tide is towards, you know, more progressive ideas. Well, move to amend feels that they very much want the constitutional amendment, not not just the voted in that can get changed out. Hannah, did you have a question? Oh, uh, no, I was going to um, make a comment, but somebody oh, already made that comment, so I don't know. Oh, okay. All <laughs> yeah. right. <laughs> I didn't want to miss you. Anybody else on that or move on? So it's also in the chapters, uh, campaign, campaign finance reforms issues kind of came up too. Um, so the third question, senators raising money for other senators is a path to increasing their power in the Senate. Um, what are the pros and cons? <laughs> and how involved is your senator in raising money for others? <laughs> 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 I don't know. I don't pay any attention to those morons. <laughs> My senator is queen of the wine cave. <laughs> I know um, right. uh, Jana and I, Senator Senator Sass. Um, I know it's been said that he was out there, but I think he kind of had to put the brakes on it because. He got in trouble for speaking badly about that former president. So, yeah. but I know he he was doing it, but now I think he's yeah. considering his own run. So, yeah, I think he's pulled pulled back a little bit. Anybody else? Any any thoughts on senators raising money for other senators? And well, I have a thought on that. Um, I think that what happens is that if senators are raising money for another senator, there's going to be a sense of obligation there. Yeah. And therefore, we're gonna have problems with them just following the party line or what they're told to do instead of really voting for what their constituents want. Yeah, again, constituents. Uh, this is how uh, I'm thinking out. it's, uh, <laughs> if, if I if I stroke your hand, you'll stroke mine, so we'll work together. You raise money for me, I raise money for you. We get into Washington, and we, we owe a lot to the other one, so we're going to go along with not necessarily what we should be doing or we want to do, but payback. 
Yep. I think at this point, since all of the senators and the congressmen, they're all in uh, enslaved to corporations and PACs anyway, it doesn't matter if they're raising money for each other because all the money is coming from the same dark places. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just the system itself is corrupt. Yeah. And so whether they're doing it, if they're doing it for uh, other, up here, <clears throat> that's just a shield as far as I'm concerned. That's mm -hmm. all it is. Well, yeah. up here in New Hampshire, of course, we get to see all the presidential candidates. And there's a good many of them that don't even have a chance at running for the presidency. So why are they all banging on our heads up here when they're not going to get in? It's not about getting in. It's, it's like when Trump ran, he didn't really want to be president. It was like a reality show for him. He didn't feel as though he had a chance to win, but it gave him a kind of name recognition that, I mean, I don't care who you are, if you're running for president, that's a different kind of name recognition. And he got that and he thought it would help his failing businesses. But it's like being in a fight and you're losing and you throw a lucky punch and knock the other guy out. Mm -hmm. That's what happened. Trump threw the lucky punch. He, he played the hate card. Yeah, exactly. People bought into it. So when people come to New Hampshire and when they go to these other places, the first three, like I think it's New Hampshire, Iowa, What's the other one? It's the first three. South Carolina. Nevada, South Carolina. Yeah. So that's just the kind of like, I know I may not have a chance of winning, but the office that I really want is now going to be more accessible to me or that committee that I really want to sit on. Now I have a better chance of getting on that because everyone will recognize me as a former presidential candidate. So it's a game. It's all just, the more I get involved in politics, the more I realize it's like, it's, just a, it's a game. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, that's yeah. right. You just want to bark like, ah. Getting back <laughs> to the question about, you know, whether, you know, certain senators or congressmen, you know, supporting other things that, you know, historically, you know, that may be, you know, um, you know for instance, having a Ted Kennedy come to maybe uh, you know uh, uh, you know a state that's sort of purple or, or you know maybe red but wants to go to think you know it could be a way of you know getting generating support and stuff and I know um, that you know those are you know that that you know on both sides you know that that you know Senator Luger also did that probably for some Republican you know somebody that you know has sort of name recognition you know and can maybe stir up, especially for some maybe younger candidate that, you know, may not have the name recognition that that could make a difference in, you know, raising the level and, and they're, you know, so it's not necessarily, uh, you know, a quid pro quo, but it, um, it, it is, you know, that that, you know, otherwise some of those people wouldn't get, you know, but if you have a big name, be it, you know, Ted Kennedy or, you know, I don't, you know, Elizabeth Warren or, you know, whoever, you know, you have that, that could make, you know, sort of a, you know, spark in that person's campaign. So, you know, that is a, you know, an aspect that you wouldn't want to eliminate. Right. That's true. That's a good point. Cause it can work for both sides, <laughs> both sides. Tracy. I just wanted to go back to the, someone who asked the question, why do people run if they don't think they have a chance? When Pete was one of those, he, uh, he, he, he ran mainly to get a conversation going about how the democratic process needs to be reformed. He just got more and more attention because he hit a nerve. And, and not everyone <laughs> has a, a higher purpose like that. Some of them, yeah, they want to get their name in the papers. But I think that when you had 25 people running, you're going to have more of those. But there, then there are people like Pete that had a, a, a message he wanted to get across, and that was one way to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, Swalwell was here, and I told him, uh, you know, he's a fantastic guy, and he just needs to get some experience under him and committees or something to get more going 
that he can offer to the public. He was just too young here, banging on doors, trying to be president. But then Pete was young too, so. Well, he's also, well you know, there's there's a certain amount of luck, I think, in there, timing. There's Things kind of all have to come together right, you know, too. So there were so many, so many great candidates. It was I a, think you have a good point where his executive experience is different than the legislative experience. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of legislators running that might not know what it's like to be the top guy and get things done. Yeah, they can work with Congress, but can they tell Congress where, where to get off when they have to? What what well, I don't like, I mean, how long it took Joe to get in presidency? Three three different tries. Yeah, I think Joe Biden was just unfortunate each time in the people that he was running against. And when he was in the field with Obama and Clinton, I mean, it was like, you're not that, those two canceled everybody else yeah. out. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so, I think, yeah. And so, and you're right, Hannah, it's like, it matters who, you know, what's in the pot at the same time, you know, because uh, people are comparing you to everyone else who's up there, so. Um, Okay, so let's go on to chapter eight. And let me just look here really quick. Okay, so chat. the first question, I'll read it. Looks like Wes put it in the, put it in the chat there. Um, during the George Bush, George W. administration, the gang of 14 senators included seven Democrats and seven Republicans signed a pledge with respect to judicial nominations that included the following. Signatories will exercise their responsibilities under the advice and consent clause of the United States Constitution in good faith. Nominees should be filibustered only under extraordinary circumstances and each signatory must use his or her own discretion and judgment in determining whether such circumstances exist. Now only Senators Graham and Collins, Collins remain in the Senate. What do you think of this pledge? I think it's crazy that someone has to take a pledge when they've already taken an oath. When I read that, I'm like, Okay, so this is like me going to the hospital and saying, I know I'm here to take care of patients, but in certain situations, these certain patients I'm not going to do unless I can find five other nurses who are going to sign a pack with me to say, we're going to do the job for which we're being paid. You know how quickly I would have been fired? Oh my gosh, that's the perfect answer. And what a great analogy that is. Seriously, right, seriously, I mean... You're talking loyalty oaths. Yeah. But yeah. you're already sworn in supposedly to represent the people who sent you there, but then you're negating that and putting a loyalty to the president yeah. alone. Well, and you're basically saying, I'm taking a pledge that says I, I will not take an action that will prevent this president from being able to appoint judges or appoint nominees, cabinet members, whatever, that he can work with to meet the goals of his administration to help the people. I mean, it's just, it's, it's it is ridiculous. It's, it's, it's ridiculous that you don't do, I mean, you don't, you just don't do stuff like that. But you can't go by me because I, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, yes, we can. <laughs> I, I, yeah, you are spot on. And I think that, mm -hmm. um, you know, the fact that you have to sign this pack <laughs> that restates your duty and oath <laughs> shows the dysfunction. Yeah. That all goes back to the filibuster. Yeah, that all goes back to the super minority having tyrannical control right. of our country. Of and, the right of the majority. Yep. And like I almost didn't really connect that until you said that. Yeah. Because at first I was kind of like, oh, Ben Nelson from Nebraska. He was part of the gang of 14, you know. Right. Bipartisanship. No, right. it's just it's just slapping unity and bipartisanship on a label that 
shouldn't have to be there, but is only there because the system is broken. Is broken. Yeah. It's a mess. Yeah. Yep. But it, yeah, it, I don't it, think, he, I don't think I saw it like that until I heard Hannah say it either. <laughs> but it negates bipartisanship because you're doing the loyalty oath. Nothing to do with by being bipartisan. Yeah, that's true, Kathleen. I mean, is, are you really bipartisan by signing that loaf? No, you're right. just saying, oh, well, we're gonna, yeah. I, it's, ugh, it's so loyalty to the dictator. The yeah, so many levels. Yeah, they just they're they're really incapable of functioning, and and doing you know, and getting anything done or doing anything for any, the people and what you know what they're supposed to do. They can't do their job. Any any other thoughts on that? See, Carolyn put at the chat. Same thing now with the problem solvers comp caucus and mansion is in it. Yeah. However, working with an equal number of Dems and GOP, Manchin is being disingenuous when he says bipartisanship is possible. It has not worked in there. Correct. Well, yeah. part of what he's working with with the no labels group too is uh, I questioned them at an event a few years ago um, to make the budget balance out. It didn't matter if they were gonna be attacking social security and, and taking money out of it to make the federal bu budget balance. And it really ticked me off. Well, I think Manchin just sees himself as a kingmaker and he's playing that role right now, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I think the others, um, the other two Democrats, are, are laying low and just keeping their heads down and keeping their mouth shut. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of like, I'm reading this, this book called the, the Good Lord Bird. And it's about John Brown and the, you know his <laughs> uh, abolitionist group. But mm -hmm. there is a line in there that the author wrote and he said, well, you know, the slaves that survived were the ones that chopped the cotton and kept their mouth shut. And I think, that these are the people the some of the people are just chopping cotton and keeping their mouths shut right now and mansion because he's not i don't know bright enough or whatever to really see what's going on he's out there well i can do this and i can do that because i have leverage now they need my vote the democrats need my vote so things that i want i can get now if he was getting something for his constituency, I wouldn't, and I know he has Republicans constituency, but they are also citizens and they're entitled to fair representation. So if he was getting something that his people need, then I could, I could understand, yeah, you're doing that. That's a part of the game, but you're not getting anything for anybody. You're sitting around telling us you're gonna negotiate with people who have looked you in your face, like for the past 12 years, is, yeah practically and said we're not going to work with you well and what has i think he's pretty smart enough i sorry uh but hannah i love because his constituency west virginia ranks in the bottom 10 on almost every index of <laughs> quality <laughs> of life <laughs> it's ridiculous I, it's just, you know, I don't understand. I'm here in Georgia and I always say the only thing that's keeping Georgia off the bottom is Alabama and Mississippi and Louisiana. <laughs> Otherwise, I mean, and it's not that much space between Georgia and the bottom. Once you get outside of Atlanta, it's like you step back into another century or something. Time, yeah. So I don't, See, I don't think any of these people are interested in policy. I just, you know, my girlfriend and I had an interesting discussion today. We said, even though Joe Biden is in the White House, why is it that so many of us still long just to have Obama back? It wasn't policy so much as he made us all feel like we counted. Yeah. He made everybody feel, I mean, he really did care and it was genuine and you felt that and you knew that and people will go a long way with you if they think that you care. But these guys, 
they just act like they don't 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 care and it, it'll be up to the republican um voters and i've spoken i've messed up and got some republican voters on my call list <laughs> and i've spoken to some republican voters here in georgia who mm -hmm. are starting to finally see the light oh interesting they were like we're supposed to fall off into these potholes down here in the street <laughs> because we hate democrats and I was like, well, I don't know, ma'am, you're going to have to ask your representatives about that. I don't deal with that. I'm just telling you that you might want to read more literature. You might want to have more deep dive conversations with people about what's really going on politically before you make a decision about how you're going to vote. I mean, that's all I can say. I mean, because, yeah. you know, we can't really get into a whole lot of stuff, but but people are starting to feel the pain now. The Republican people here in Georgia, citizens are starting to realize that all of this stuff, it's a real broad broom and it's gonna, it's, it sweeps clean. It sweeps everybody mm -hmm. out. Yeah. You know? And I would include not just men, women in that category that are supposed to be representing voters and they're not, they're just doing their power thing. Well, I yeah. think women are, are though more likely to fight. I mean, some women won't, the, the privileged and really- No, no, I don't, I don't mean the voters. I mean, those who have been elected to be in DC representing us. The women in the need to be lumped in with the men as well for not doing right by the citizens. Yeah, but I don't think there are that many women that you can say that about because the women themselves are victims of the of the system. So I think that they, most of them, I don't know, with women, I put them in a special category. They're kind of like politicians, you know, who are like the viper from New York who just got in. <laughs> well, yeah, there are, there are exceptions, oh. honestly. <laughs> but, but when you start thinking about the voices of the women who have been elected in past years, those women have been very strong voices. Mm -hmm. It's hard to, to, I mean, even with Susan Collins, who, I mean, I want to send her a pair of flip-flops, but she is, she tries and then she gets scared. Um, and so you would you would need a woman, you know, like a Hillary Clinton, someone who's saying, well, you know, I'll put it all out there, win, lose, or draw. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter. I'm going to at least try to do what is right. And she did. So I don't know. But Collins, I was at an event and Collins uh, would not answer. She just stayed nimble about stuff in a former uh, Supreme Court justice was there and he wouldn't let the media try to corner him, but Collins refused. It was about Kavanaugh. She refused to respond to any questions thrown at her at uh, St. Anselm's College. Mm. Well, and don't you think, I mean, like Suzanne Collins, Lisa Murkowski, uh, yeah. you know, there, there's some others too that they don't fully go where you can tell they want to go because they won't get money to support mm -hmm. the re-election campaigns. Yep. They're not going to get those coveted, you know, committee uh, seats um, because of how the Senate is being ran now. Like if you are, I mean, look at John McCain. He voted against, you know, uh, or he voted to keep the Affordable Care Act and look how he was treated after that. And look how he was treated when it came to campaign finance reform, right. you know, with McCain-Feingold uh, campaign finance, you know, like, I mean, yes, Democrats, I, I, I just don't recall Democrats killing their own so much compared to what we've seen here. And I think it's just because of the structure of the Senate. Yeah. The structure of the it's Senate. horrible. So you know, Tracy, I, and I want to say something in, in defense of white women which okay this is going to be a new thing for me <laughs> but uh seriously just sometimes i get angry 
I get very angry and I, I say, you know, that white women have been very privileged and they've been, and, and so they now, they want black women to join them in all this stuff. But when it was stuff about us, they were nowhere to be found while black women were putting themselves out there. But then I think, well, that's because we've always faced life and we've had in a way that we've had to adopt the point of view of the mongoose because a mongoose tackles a snake. <laughs> she got this little bitty critter that's got to deal with the venomous snake. Black women have lived that way. We have, it's not just the poor black women versus black no, women no, who have maybe, money. It's all of us. Especially and, in the workplace that they'll, they'll backstab each other to keep the other one from getting ahead instead of mentoring each other and, and helping each other along. I've seen this for my entire working career. It's crazy. With it's white females? It's with anyone else. I don't get it. And I, I think that the, in categorizing, you'd have to break it down even more because poor white women are not on the status of yeah, I'm thinking many of the rich women white think, women. Every, every decision they, have, they make has to be reflecting the interests of their husbands. That's something. <laughs> Yeah, but if you were white and you wanted to be something and you were a white woman, the chances of a door being opened from you, poor or not, was greater True. because of the color of your skin. That's, that's the handicap in your golf game. Yes. Your skin color is always going to give you a handicap to help no level that there. playing field for you. No argument there. No. <laughs> but I just think that it's still difficult for, for them because. I just think my mother is an example. She worked her entire life. She was one of the first women to go back to work when her kids were small in the early 60s. And instead of advocating for the ERA, which would have helped her have a better chance of getting a, a good salary. I mean, her whole paycheck went to groceries. It, it's, it's pretty much the only reason she was working was for groceries. But she let people argue because she was married, and had a husband who was making a paycheck. She didn't need it. Because she was socialized that way. Right. That's that she right. was too, she was socialized that way. That's right. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. And so I just, I like I'm saying, that's why I can't be so angry anymore because we all face challenges and pressures, regardless of whether we're white or black or whatever we are we face these pressures and they get socialized into us and it's difficult to break out of them. And so that's why I've altered my opinion about, I think white women like black women are just trying to survive in the environment that they're in. And well, how do we make the changes like uh, Schumer goes and picks who he wants to be running for the Senate money and, and uh, means are, are given to those candidates. And you can have some very good candidates who don't have a chance to run because they can't get the powerful Washington DC US senators backing them to even run a campaign. Yeah, it's a real problem, you know, not to get good people if you don't have money. You know, we met with our, we met with three uh, congressmen these were African-American female. We met with Representative Lee, um, the, the, the lady that uh, was one of the impeachment managers, the black lady that was uh, from, she represents the Virgin Islands. Oh, right. right. Yeah, her and then one other. And they were saying to us, the problem they encounter though, is that when they go to these corporations, they'll say, they'll give, say, a white male candidate X amount of dollars. They'll give the white female candidate the next tier of money. And they will, um, if they contribute at all to them, it will be a, a very minuscule amount. And Representative Lee said when she, the first time she announced that she was going to run, they told her, well, you're not an electable candidate and anyway you aren't going to have the money and so her mom and her sisters start hitting the clubs and the bars and the churches and that's how she raised the fifty thousand dollars 
to finance her first campaign. But she said that these, these corporations, they have certain things that they want and they identify certain people who can get those things for them. And those are the people that they finance. And most of the time, those are white males who have been in the house for a long time. And the Senate, because if you can survive the house, just think about it. If you can be in the house forever, that's quite a feat because you have to get elected every two years. Right, but right. even on the state level, a friend of mine did not come up with $50,000 that he had to raise on his own during the month of August a few years back. And the Democratic Party dumped him off because their requirement was you raise X amount on your own. So the parties need to work better, stronger with the candidates. Oh, definitely. Awesome. Well, I hope you everyone enjoyed uh, that opportunity to get into smaller groups and um, discuss the questions um, that we had for you this evening and anything else that popped up uh, in regards to what Gentleson uh, wrote. And so we're going to hear from a representative from each group who's just going to do a short little um, share on what we all discussed. And so um, Jamel, who I'm um, sharing from room number one tonight. Myra. All right, Myra, we will get you unmuted. Hey. Um, yeah, so we, you know, we had a really good discussion about um, just the partisanship the ev evolution of partisanship that's happened in the Senate and the effect that that's having on politicians and um, their relationships and what's coming out of the Senate. Um, and, you know, we kind of, we went through um, Lyndon Johnson and we talked about how, uh, how that, how, how he changed, he manipulated the Senate. He's the one who like originally start, one of the original people who started manipulating Senate rules to change them for power um, and how that's been a theme of leaders, um, uh, you know, from then to now um, and how that's, you know, increasing that this, um, seeking of power is increasing partisanship and um, just tension in Washington in general. And, all, and we also talked about, um, you know, we talked a lot about good faith and what, the, what that means um, in Congress and, you know, about the, the, the 14 thing and how like it, partisanship got worse after that and how like, you know, all, good faith became worse after that instead of better. And so like, why? And then, so so my thought to why is obviously like the super minority, um, you know, always really um, keeping those leaders really entrenched in, 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 the, in, the, in, in the things that really just a really small amount of people in, the, in, in this country want. Uh, but they have an inordinate amount of power because of how the Senate works and how these leaders have manipulated the rules over time. Yeah, so that's, <laughs> so that's what we discussed. You know, just some light, light, um, you know. Tad. <laughs> fluffy things, puppies. <laughs> Thank you, Myra. We appreciate it. And um, I believe Kathleen is going to be sharing for room two. Yep, I will unmute Kathleen. Oh, whoops. Where did she go? There she goes. Okay. I'm going to kill y'all. I hope you'll hear me better. We can. Um, sound good. We talked a lot about the same things that she just went through. It was more all the way from Johnson to McConnell. 
and the lack of government for us and the power in the government is really for the senators and how they want to rule. And we talked about women senators, the fear that keeps them from doing what is right for the voters. And we talked about the Gang of 14 and, and signing oil, the loyalty of for seven M7 Republicans, but packing a pack of loyalty to, uh, loyalty to the president. And uh, not being voters, uh, not being uh, for the voters, but doing the piece of us. Hope you can hear me. Kathleen, it's getting a little harder to hear you. It's breaking up now. Could you hear me? It, it broke, it started to break mm -hmm. up there for the like the last 30 seconds. That's why I killed the video to hopefully you could hear. Now we can hear you a lot clearer. Oh, okay. Um, well, we talked about the women senators being, okay, good. Um, uh, the women senators being in fear because they need the money and they don't want to lose their reelections and lose their committees. And them uh, just keep doing what they do instead of uh, doing the right thing and uh, doing work for the voters. And another big thing was uh, under George W. Bush, the gang of 14, seven Dems, seven Republicans, they had loyalty to the signing for the pact to the president and not being loyal to the voters and doing what was what the voters needed them to do for work. It's kind of like the crux of what we got to, but lots of great discussion. Thank you, Kathleen, appreciate it. And um, I hope you all enjoyed that. Um, one thing I really, um, you know, what I heard Myra and, uh, you know, from our discussion and group two is that um, the structure of the Senate is, needs to be reformed. It's broken. And, you know, we can put it on, you really can blame both sides because Johnson is a Democrat, you know, and uh, we, both parties have taken an advantage of it. And the only way for the system to truly to reflect the desires of the people is through reform. And uh, that's why, you know, building bridges, we are huge advocates of democratic reform. When uh, Jamel was the one who, um, you know, share, shared this book idea with us and um, boom, automatically, you know, we realized that, yeah, this is a great book that really touches on democratic reform. Um, and uh, I feel like many of us have said in the chats and in breakout conversations, how much we are learning about how truly the system is broken, especially in the Senate. And probably, we probably knew about it to a degree, but uh, it's a lot larger than probably what many of us realized. And just that deep racist history on that filibuster and it being the crux of that uh, brokenness. And so thank you. Um, to Kathleen and to Myra for sharing that uh, report back from us. We love that. Um, and Jamel, you make a great point in the chat. The beauty is the Senate has the ability to change itself through its rules. And um, someone in our group mentioned it uh, in our breakout discussion is contact, um, contact your speakers or your members of Congress and continually to do it. Whether they're Democrats or uh, Republicans, uh, let them know how you feel about votes and how they voted or didn't vote. Because the more and more they hear from us is the when we take our power back from them and uh, give it to us, the people. And so um, great discussion. I'm going to share my screen just to share a few um, 
highlights and announcement because I saw someone put a great question in there and we got the answer, even though I know someone already answered it. But next week, you all need to show up and you need to bring three to five friends with you to show up because the author, Adam Gentleson himself, will be joining us um, next Monday for a Q&A. I have a feeling we're going to use all 45 minutes of that conversation, maybe even a little bit longer, because as I was reading um, these two chapters, I certainly started thinking of some questions I want to ask Adam. So we hope you can join and bring a few friends uh, along. Also, uh, Building Bridges, we're a grassroots organization and like Jana and Jamel and uh, Jenny who are, you know, helping with book club and helping in other areas, we could use more help to uh, continue to uh, promote the events and causes that we are passionate about. And so um, in June, we have a meeting where you can learn more about that. And then some ways that we allow uh, grassroots organized to mobilize and uh, support candidates and causes that we believe in. We have Wednesday movie nights. We have Sunday uh, games and postcarding. And then on Fridays, every other Friday, we write letters for a cause. And just a heads up, this coming Friday, our focus is on the For the People Act. And I, uh, if you've been following along, it is it's, t it's a crucial time for us to be reaching out and communicating our desires um, to restore our democracy for, through this, uh, through HR1 and S1. So um, hopefully you can join to support that. It's fun. We play music. Sometimes there's a live performance and you get a, a write or email uh, your Congress people to let them know how you feel about passionate causes or about progressive causes. Um, some candidates that we're supporting right now, Jalen McKee Rodriguez is running for city council in a runoff uh, in San Antonio, Texas. And then Martin Allen Cummings is running for city council in New York City. And so we support those candidates primarily through postcard writing. Um, so it's a fun, easy way for organizers to get engaged and support progressives from across the country. And then one thing Jenny mentioned, um, she does a lot of uh, training for building bridges. There's amazing training that Jenny and Kaz are a part of. Uh, coming this week on Thursday is a series called Say This, Not That, because what we say and how we say it is so important in order for it to connect with um, those individuals who maybe aren't fully on our side. Um, and then also for just making sure us as progressives are using the correct messaging to get our um, things accomplished. And best way for you to be engaged with us and to help amplify our events like book club is through social media. So Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, uh, Twitter. You can go to our YouTube channel to find um, the last three weeks um, recordings. And um, so that's always a great way to engage and stay on top of all that we are doing. And I believe Vanessa has uploaded all these links into the chat. So um, it, you know, honestly, the easiest one to click on is our website because then that directs you to everything that we all talked about. So um, that's all we have for you tonight. We're so thankful that you have chosen to join us on this Monday evening and you should be able to unmute yourself and uh, we'll all say our goodbyes and we're gonna see you all back next week as we uh, wrap up our conversation with Adam. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Bye. See you next week. Bye. 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 Bye.